If you could with me, could you turn to the book of Amos and chapter 3 in your Bibles? Um, like uh, what was said, my name is Nick Gherkin. Um, I am a student at Moody Bible Institute during the school year, but over the summer, I like to intern with uh, Village Church. And I get to experience and sort of see what the pastors do and how they do it. And every so often, they give me the honor of preaching in front of a congregation. And so that is what Pastor Steve has done. He has blessed me with the opportunity to study God's Word with you today. And if you are a guest with us, like myself, um, we want to welcome you here and hope and pray that God has been working in your life and preparing you uh, for today. But first, let's pray. Father God, thank you very much for uh, your word that you've given it to us to study and to know who you are, to know what you're about and how to live in that reality. Father, your word in Romans says, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, for our endurance, for our encouragement, and for our hope. So Father, I pray that you would instruct us and teach us out of Amos 3 this morning. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. So for the past three weeks, we have been going over the book of Amos, and Pastor Steve introduced us to the roaring lion from Zion in chapter 1. This roaring lion is God, and he is warning the people of Israel, along with the surrounding nations, of this coming judgment. And so in chapter 1, we were introduced to this roaring lion. In chapter 2, we see that amongst this judgment, southern Israel— or southern Judah and northern Israel is also part of this judgment. They are not escaping this standard that God had set for them. And so the judgment comes, and at, today we are going to open up and study chapter 3. But if you haven't noticed, the prophets, including the book of Amos, are a little different than the rest of the Bible. We've got um, all sorts of genres found in Scripture, and you can find most of these genres at your bookstore. You got poetry, narrative, history, uh, law and dictation. You even got some apocalyptic uh, literature. But the prophets are sort of like a, like a mix of all of these literatures. And so sometimes it's hard for us to understand because they'll, they'll be talking about one thing and then switch into poetry and then switch into history, and it's kind of hard to follow. But mostly we're uncomfortable with the prophets because of their themes of divine justice and the wrath and anger of God and, and these messages of colossal judgment on a national level. This makes us uncomfortable and, and the prophets have a very different flavor than the rest of the Bible. And for some of us, reading the prophets is like drinking coffee for the first time. It's bitter. Your stomach's not used to it. It might make you a little queasy. It just tastes odd in your mouth. But as we continue to study Scripture and your spiritual taste buds begin to adapt, you will start to detect the sweetness of God's mercy in these passages. We will experience a new energy as we explore the relationship between God's justice and his mercy. And you'll come to find that what the prophets have to offer is good— and you'll come to enjoy it. So without further ado, let us study our passage today in Amos 3. This is the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord has spoken to you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Do two walk together unless they agree to meet? Does a lion roar in the forest when it has no prey? Does a young lion cry out from his den if he has taken nothing? Does a bird fall in a snare in the earth when there is no trap? Does a snare spring up from the ground when it has taken nothing? Is a trumpet blown in the city and the people are not afraid? Does disaster come upon a city, city unless the Lord has done it? For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets to the prophets. The, ro the lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, but who can prophesy? 
Proclaim to the strongholds in Ashdod and the strongholds in the land of Egypt and say, Assemble yourselves in the mountains of Samaria and see the great tumults within her and the oppressed in her midst. They do not know how to do right, declares the Lord. Those who store up violence and robbery in their strongholds. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an adversary shall surround the land and bring down your defenses from you. And your strongholds shall be plundered. Thus says the Lord, as a shepherd rescues from the mouth of a lion two legs or a piece of the ear, so shall the people of Israel who dwell in Samaria be rescued from the corner of a couch and part of a bed. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord God, God of hosts. On that day, I punish Israel for his transgressions. I will punish the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. I will strike the winter house along with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall come to an end, declares the Lord. Now, this is the hard part. This was written to a people at a specific time, to a specific people with a specific land. And we sometimes have a hard time connecting this to, to us. And what does this mean for us today? And I believe as people today who are known by God, right? It starts in verse 2, that I've known you. As the people who are also known by God, we can be taught three things from this passage. Number one, which is in your notes, we have great privileges and are therefore greatly accountable. Looking back to verse 1 and 2, it says, Hear the word of the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I have brought out up out of Egypt. He's addressing Judah and he is addressing northern uh, Israel. You only... I have known of all the families of the earth, and therefore I will punish you for your iniquities. In these first two verses, God is bringing up, stirring up the imagery of the only two covenants that he has made with Israel. He has taken them with uh, Abraham. He made the Abrahamic covenant, and he chose a specific family by which his name will be known. He chose a specific family by which God is going to reveal himself to the world and by which those people are going to worship him. He has pulled them, set them apart for himself. And then he brings up the Mosaic Covenant, saying that he's brought them out of Egypt and he's, a, he's saved them from their oppressors and then shown them through the law a better way of living. He's made two deeply intimate covenants with them. And look at the word that God uses to describe his people. He says, you only I have known. Some of your Bibles, like the NIV, and uh, I saw a MacArthur uh, NSAB back there, um, they use the word chosen. But the word in the Greek here, or in the Hebrew here, is known. And in Scripture, this is used many times. It's used to mean intellectually to know something, to believe something, uh, to just acquire knowledge. But more often than not, when God is describing his people, he uses this word in a more intimate way. In the same way he talks about Adam and Eve, when Adam knew his wife, when Cain knew his wife, when a husband in a, in a loving covenant knows his wife, that intimacy, that vulnerability, that's the type of language that God is using here with Israel. You I have known. I have chosen you like a bride out of the nations. I could have chose anybody, and I, I chose you. And then I revealed myself. I became vulnerable and showed you my heart through the law and what I think of justice and how I want to be shown love and worship. And I have revealed myself to you, and yet you have turned away from me. The prophets often use the language of, of Israel being like a bride to God. God calls Israel the apple of his eye in Deuteronomy and Zechariah. Many of the prophets describe Israel as, and God as a husband and wife in a covenant relationship. Israel of all the nations. 
being given this great undeserved privilege of experiencing God, the creator almighty God in a more intimate way than the rest of the world. He chose them. He bound himself to them, revealed his heart, and gifted them with the best of land in Canaan and given them prosperity, given them wealth, blessing them, gifting them. And but yet, despite this great privilege, despite all of this, Israel turns away, seeks after other gods, and lives in lawlessness. And God is describing this as heartbreak. In other books like Hosea, he calls Israel like a wife who has left her husband to live in adulterous relationships as a prostitute and to choose lesser men, lesser people, to choose lesser gods. And so this isn't a, a, a far away, angry, um, sterilized deity that's just punishing and throwing down lightning, but a heartbroken husband who's been broken over the adulterous relationship after giving all that wasn't enough, I guess. Then God moves into this uh, sort of question-answer, rhetorical questions that's supposed to evoke these emotions and imagery to make a point. He talks about in, starting in verse 3, do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? Israel, can you and I walk together unless we're in covenant? Yet you have walked away and you are no longer walking with me. There's conflict in that relationship. Does a lion roar in the forest without a prey? Israel, do I not send my prophets unless there's a reason for it? Do I not send my prophets unless I'm warning you of something that you need to turn away from because my judgment is coming? So God talks about setting a trap. He talks about setting a trap. Like a bird, he's going to set a trap and that trap is not going to spring without a reason. Israel, that trap is not going to spring without a reason. And I'm going to send a serious People are not afraid. Does disaster come on a city unless the Lord has done it?
And this leads us to our next point. Test. Put that on. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Is that better? Can you guys hear me? Without the all right, without the static. <clears throat> Let's go back a little bit. God has chosen two of these nations: Ashdod and Egypt. And we know. Egypt were the oppressors of Israel. They were the ones stomping Israel into the ground, and God had saved them from that. Ashdod, in the book of 1 Samuel, was this kingdom that, that took the Ark of the Covenant, brought it into their land, and set it up amongst the rest of the pagan uh, temple goddess and goddesses. And so God is, is bringing these two on, and they're really poor examples of worshiping God. And yet even they are looking at Israel and seeing the oppression. Even they are looking at how bad it can be. They might represent pagan worship and oppression, but Israel now has turned around and been a worst version of it. And they bear the name of God. They carry his reputation. And through Israel... Scripture talks about this back and forth. Through Israel, God was going to reveal himself to the world. They were the funnel point. You want to know who God is? You go to Israel and you meet the God. You meet God. God Almighty, the creator God. And you would go through Israel to find access and knowledge of who he is. And the world would know who God is and what he's like through the worship of him in Israel. The nations would look at Israel and say, that's how you worship God. And so now you can kind of see the nations are looking at Israel and seeing some of the most horrific worship practices known in the Middle East at that time and saying, is that how you serve your God? It's almost like you're no different than the rest of us. In fact, it's like you're us, but then worse. And then your scriptures say something different. So either your God's not powerful, or your God isn't good, or your God doesn't exist, or this is how you worship your God, and your scriptures just kind of contradict each other. And so with all that confusion that the Gentile nations are going to be looking at them with, God calls up two 
examples and say, witness the horrible practices of Israel and also witness the judgment that's going to come on them because I will vindicate my name even amongst the Gentiles. I will clear my name amongst the Gentiles. You see, if Israel would not be a champion of God's justice, then they would be made an example of God's justice and be publicly punished and corrected. I was just talking to uh, someone this morning who was on the security staff, um, and I was like, I introduced myself. I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm Nick Gherkin. He, he's like, oh yeah, I know the rest of your family already. And un- believe it or not, that happens really often. For some reason, the Gherkin family seems to be known far and wide. And Gherkin means a lot of things to a lot of people. So in high school, my teachers already knew who I was because my older brother, Taylor, with the last name Gherkin that he was using, they already knew him. And so there was already a reputation. I have gone to many different places, gone to completely different states, and said, hey, I'm Nick Gherkin. They're like, like Michelle and Gherkin, Michelle and Tim Gherkin, you're, you're their son. And I'm like, yes, how do you know them? And there's already this like established relationship. I went to Oswego once. I was with my youth pastor and we were going to go pick up a like baby stroller off of Let Go or, or eBay or Craigslist or something. And I was going with him and we were chatting and whatnot. And we went into this house and this woman, like as soon as I entered the house, she had the baby stroller and she looks at me and just goes, do you have a brother named Alexander Gherkin? And I was like, yes, odd. A little strange. How do you know him? And they're like, oh yeah, I went to school with him. You look just like him, except you're like six inches shorter. And I was like, okay, just give us the stroller. Let's get out of here. Like, <laughs> but it's not uncommon, and it continues to happen even today, that people know the Gherkin name, the reputation that comes with the Gherkin name. The, the name that I bear kind of has different avenues. Each one of my siblings represent the Gherkin name in different ways. And I got to experience firsthand what it is like when you let down or defile that kind of name. When I was um, in high school, I was part of an after-school program, and it was me and maybe like 10 to 15 other uh, friends of mine that were in high school, and there was no teacher in the room because it was after school. They all left. And it was just me and a bunch of other people, and we were playing music off of our phones. And I remember we were just playing song after song after song. And for whatever reason, I decided I was going to play a song that I found off the internet. And this song was horrible. And look, looking back, I'm ashamed of it. It was horrible. The lyrics were vulgar. There was so many sexual tones to it. It was, it was just horrible. And I played it specifically because I knew that my friends would be shocked because of it. It was so bad that even my unbelieving friends, even my friends that don't go to church or have a moral standard, even they were, were like taken aback at first and were like, whoa, this is, this is intense. And as teenagers go, when something like that happens, even though they know it's wrong, they start laughing. And so I took that as like an affirmation. So I kept on playing it. And I remember I had set my, my phone across the room and I was sort of like dancing around because I'm a fool. And I remember everyone was looking at me, and then everyone's face just goes white. Eyes big, and they're all staring towards me. I was like, what? And I I turn around, and there, looming over me, in the most comedic cartoon way, was my principal. And he was, he's a big, stern man. And I remember I turned around, and I, I just saw like half of his face, and just dove across the room to try and pause my phone before I could say anything worse. But it was too late. He had already been standing there. And he just looks at me, and I'm almost peeing my pants at that point, and he just says, I'll talk to you later, and just walks out. I was horrified. He gave me a detention later and called my parents, and it gets worse. I came back home. My parents had me sit down, put my phone in front of me, and play the very same song in front of them. And I got to watch their face twist in horror as their son, as they realized their son was playing this publicly. And I don't remember the exact words, but paraphrasing, the the message that they were saying is, Nick, we're disappointed. 
that you have, have done this. And we're horrified that this is a song that you would play. But we're more horrified, we're more disappointed because your principal, he's not a Christ follower and he's not a Christian. And he knows that the Gherkins are and we represent him. And so, listen, yeah, maybe our name has gotten a smudge in it, but what does he think about God now? How does he feel about Christians? And it just hit me like a load of bricks. I felt just enormous guilt, and my parents made me write a letter to him and then come up to him during school and apologize and, and to make sure and to let them know, listen, this is not how a Christian should act. I was... I was doing something, I was behaving in a way that a Christian should not act. And that, to this day, has always stuck with me. It has always stuck with me. I will always remember that and the punishment and embarrassment that came with that. And so what can we learn from this text? God hates, he hates when sin damages his name. And when sin damages his children who represent him, he hates when our sin causes us to wander off down dangerous paths and when the innocent and the oppressed are slaughtered. He hates when his people's sin leads the rest of the world towards condemnation rather than towards justice and towards salvation. Because folks, it's, it's by his name that we are saved. It's by his name that we are saved. And here's the thing. God is allowed to be angry, right? When we're talking about the prophets, we get uncomfortable with this idea. We get really uncomfortable with it because we have like the book of Romans, which is like, there's no condemnation. And we have the rest of the New Testament, which is like Jesus is love and he's good and there's mercy and that's great, but that's all predicated on the judgment and justice of God. And he is allowed and he is just and holy to be angry at sin. And let me tell you something today. If, if you've never been told this in your life, whether you're a Christ follower, whether you're an unbeliever, or whether you're in this gray zone in between, God is angry with your sin. He is angry with your sin and what it does to his name and what it does to you as you represent his name. And he is holy, and he is just the punishment to punish it. But there is a difference on how that anger plays out as his children. As those who have been called by his name, there's a difference on how that plays out. For the pagan people of Israel, their punishment was absolute and without mercy. Right? So whether it was the, the um, Aramaeans in Damascus, the Philistines in Gaza, the Phoenicians in Tyre, the Edomites, the uh, Ammonites or the Moabites, their destruction was absolute. And by Jesus' time, those names were smudged like fresh ink on a paper. They were gone, indistinguishable. Because when Assyria and Babylon came in, their families mingled. And those people groups, and essentially their worship and their culture, were smudged out amongst the rest of the people groups. And there was no Moabites, Edomites, Amerians, Phoenicians. By Jesus' time, they were all gone. Their punishment and their name was wiped out. But for Israel, for those who are called by his name, by, for the people that are known by him, they did not receive destruction for their sin, but rather discipline for their sin. Which brings us to our third point. Like Israel, we are adopted into his family as his children. And therefore, God will discipline us when we wander off. He will discipline us when we wander off. Let's look at verses 12 through 15. It's this last section here. He says, Thus says the Lord, As a shepherd rescues from the mouth of a lion two legs or a piece of the ear, so shall the people of Israel who dwell in Samaria be rescued with the corner of a couch and part of a bed. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord, the God of hosts. On that day, I will punish Israel for his transgressions. I will punish the altars of Bethel and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. 
I will strike the winter house along with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall come to an end, declares the Lord. What can we learn from this section is that no punishment from God is ever painless or costless. Growing up, no punishment, no spanking, no grounding had ever been painless. It had costed me something. And God's punishment was severe, but he had kept a remnant for himself. And he uses these really gruesome details, right? God is this roaring lion. And like a shepherd who tries to save a, a, a lamb from the lion's mouth and is pulling on the two front paws, but the lion escapes with the body and all that's left are these two legs. Or all that's left is a piece of an ear. Or... Like a house fire, the corner of a bed or the corner of a couch will be the people of Israel. Because this judgment is going to come and it's going to happen and it, won't, it will not be stopped. But though the lamb is dead, there is a piece of it left still. Though Israel as a nation is going to be consumed by the Assyrians if they do not repent of their sin, consumed completely, and the nation in itself is going to be dead, over, done, gone, it will no longer be an independent state. I will save for myself a remnant of the people, and your name will not be cut off because my covenant is still with you. I will save a remnant of my people. So there is mercy. There is mercy. Not utterly come to Distractions. Also, this discipline is meant for us to be refined toward holiness. For the Israelites, God said he's going to cut off the horns of the altar at Bethel and destroy the houses of the luxurious. Now, the history of the uh, uh, altar at Bethel, if we could go to our next slide, when the nations were split apart, and there was Israel and there was Judah, when they split apart, the king of the northern tribe understood something, that all worship happens in Jerusalem, which is in Judea. And so to, to make sure that the people weren't going back down and worshiping in Jerusalem, because he feared that like, if they came back together, the nations would reunite and he'd lose his kingdom. So to make sure that didn't happen, he said, we have to keep people from going down and worshiping. And in 1 Kings, it says this, After seeking his advice from his counselors, the king made two golden calves and said to the people, Is it too much? It is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. One he set in Bethel, and the one he set in Dan. He built these altars against the law of God, because all worship has to happen at the temple in Jerusalem. He built these temples these shrines opposing the law of God. But what's worse is that these altars at the very top and the very bottom, they became the hub of all pagan worship in Israel. And all sorts of pagan gods were worshipped like Baal and Molech and Asherah, which, were, which they required them to do sick and twisted things like roll up their babies in cloth and roll them into a giant fire to sacrifice them or to sleep with temple prostitutes that may have been very, very young so that there is fertility. And so these, these places became the hub of it. They would go to Bethel and they would sacrifice to God according to the law and then turn around and kill their infants. And God's name was defiled because of it. And God said he's going to tear down these altars and destroy the homes that they built off of the backs of the oppressed. After selling them for a sandal, they paid for their house. After stomping people on the ground, they built their house. And he's going to destroy them. And here, he's doing it because God is going to take away their stumbling block that led them there in the first place. Yes, this judgment is fiery, but it is refining and not consuming. And we learn this that after 70 years in exile, and the people returned, the very first thing that they did was build the temple so that they could worship God. And from that moment on, the Israelites never, ever, ever, ever had a problem with worshiping the pagans' gods. Because they look back to their exile, they look back to that destruction, and they go, yeah, God's for real. 
and we fear him. We're not going to mess around with him. And so because of that punishment, we've been corrected, and we will not go back to that. We refuse to go back to that. We fear our God now. We fear our covenant God. And so because they were the family of God, they received discipline instead of destruction. And this is the mercy that we can so often forget when reading the prophets. We see the language of destruction, but amongst that, there is always this language of mercy that when we study it together, we can see. The prophets are a lot like the night sky. It's dark, it's looming, but here and there you see these stars, these brilliant lights that lead us back to God. Amidst the judgment and the justice of God, we can see that God is still working for the good of those who love him. Church, God, he is just. And he is angry with his people's sin. And he will punish that sin. But for those who are found in Christ, they have taken shelter under the cross. And that justice and wrath that is in that cup has been poured out on Jesus Christ. And there is not a drop in the cup of wrath that has been saved for you. Rather, there is punishment, discipline, and refinement towards holiness as you represent his name. Instead, those who are sons and daughters are corrected. I'll leave you with this. Hebrews 12, 6 says this, For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. A few verses later, he goes on and says, But he, God, disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. So church, we've been given a great privilege, and we are accountable to that as we show the world who God is. We bear his name, and therefore we need to avoid defiling it, lest he vindicate his name. In church, we are adopted into his family, and therefore he will punish us when we have sinned. But that wrath that rolled over the rest of the world, that has not been saved for us.